afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for the release of the Bipartisan Policy Center's report entitled Combating the Opioid Crisis, Smarter Spending to Enhance Federal Response. I'm Bill Hoagland, Senior Vice President here at the Bipartisan Policy Center, and I have the pleasure of working with our health team here. Uh, for those of you who may be unfamiliar with BPC, we were established about 15 years ago by four former majority leaders of the United States Senate, the late Senator Howard Baker, and Senator Bob Dole on the Republican side, Senator George Mitchell and Senator Tom Daschle on the Democratic side. And as our name would imply, we seek to find uh, bipartisan solutions to the challenges facing policymakers in this very politically polarized environment that we find ourselves in today. Today's report is the third in a series we have issued uh, tracking federal expenditures addressing the opioid epidemic. Uh, the BPC team was led by our chief medical advisor, Dr. Anand Parak, and senior policy analyst, Michelle Gilbert. They worked with a bipartisan task force composed of former cabinet members, federal and state elected officials, and subject matter experts from both parties. Our goal was and continues to be to find bipartisan approaches to more effectively allocate those federal dollars, both discretionary dollars and mandatory uh, in addressing mandatory spending and addressing this crisis. I, I think this report comes at an important time. Uh, last November, the CDC released provisional data showing that the U.S. had surpassed over 100,000 drug over overdoses, deaths in a 12-month period. And this disease of depression, as some have called it, has taken over half a million lives in the last 20 years. And unfortunately, that death toll continues to rise. At the very same time, the federal spending on opioid-related programs has increased to an all-time high, nearly $6.7 billion appropriated this year. Um, and uh, at least four times that amount, nearly $23 billion annually to the federal, state, and Medicaid program, not counting Medicare spending. Some might question whether this level of current expenditures is working. Our discussion today will focus on recommendations aimed to optimize federal spending and improve the federal, state, local response to the opioid crisis. As the crisis continues to evolve and with illicit fentanyl on the rise, we believe the recommendations that support are more important than ever. So finally, on behalf of BPC, I want to extend our thanks to the Foundation of Opioid Response Efforts for their support of today's event and this report. I'd also like to particularly thank our task force members, three of whom you'll hear from shortly here, including Dr. Jerome Adams, the former U.S. Surgeon General, Dr. Patricia Harris, former President of the American Medical Association, and former HHS Secretary and Congresswoman Donna Shalala. The other task force members were former Kentucky Governor Steve Bashir, former Congresswoman Mary Bono, and Dr. Richard Frank, currently the Leonard D. Schaefer Chair at the Brookings Institute. Thank you as well again to the BPC, BPC staff, Dr. Parak, Michelle Gilbert, and Michael Lovegrove, who, are, uh, who has helped us organize a lot of this today, and two of our consultants, Jeffrey Lardo and Tim Swope. We're now going to hear from Senator Joe Manchin of West Virginia, a state that knows firsthand how devastating this epidemic can be for hardworking families, uh, communities, and businesses in his state. Senator Manchin. Hello, I'm United States Senator Joe Manchin. I regret that I'm unable to join you all in person today to discuss the Bipartisan Policy Center's new report on how to combat the opiate crisis, but I'm glad I'm able to join you virtually to highlight the importance of addressing the drug epidemic that is ravaging our nation, especially my home state of West Virginia. I want to thank the Bipartisan Policy Center for their work on this topic to provide recommendations on how to effectively combat the opiate epidemic while being good stewards of taxpayer dollars. West Virginians know all too well that the Mountain State is ground zero for the drug epidemic, and each of us has experienced the devastating effects that substance use disorder has on our loved ones families, and our communities. As we continue to face this horrific drug epidemic during the continuing COVID-19 pandemic, 
we must work together to address the issues facing our nation to help our fellow Americans in need. From November 2020 to November 2021, more than 106,000 Americans and 1,500 West Virginians died from a drug-related overdose. overdose. Overdose deaths involving fentanyl represent more than two-thirds of all overdoses in 2020. Fentanyl has now displaced opiates and heroin as a leading cause of drug-related overdose deaths. It is clear the COVID-19 pandemic is exasperating this heartbreaking crisis. We have a responsibility, all of us, to step up and do everything that we can to combat this epidemic. We must tackle this problem from every angle. Family assistance, counseling programs, consumer and medical education, support for law enforcement, everything from local policy changes to federal legislation. I have been a strong supporter of several pieces of legislation focused on tackling the drug epidemic, like the Comprehensive Addiction and Recovery Act, the 21st Century Cures Act, and the Support for Patients and Communities Act, all of which were passed by Congress and signed into law by both Democrat and Republican presidents over the last few years. And I will continue to urge my colleagues in the Senate to pass several bipartisan bills that I've introduced, including the Fight Fentanyl Act, which would permanently schedule illicitly manufactured and deadly fentanyl-related substances, as well as the Lifeboat Act, which would establish a stewardship fee to provide and expand access to substance use treatment. I also led the way in ensuring that the formula used to allocate drug epidemic specific funding included metrics to target funding to the states that needed it the most. Because of that metric, this critical funding is now being directed to the states with the highest death rates and the greatest needs, including West Virginia. Every American knows someone whose life has been touched by substance use. Our common goal in 2022 must be fully addressing this epidemic and its devastating impacts in our communities. Thank you all for your tireless efforts, and God bless each and every one of you. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. We're now particularly honored to have Director of the Office of National Drug Control Policy join us, Dr. Rahul Gupta. Uh, this is a position is often referred to as the US drug czar. Uh, Dr. Gupta is a practicing primary care physician of 25 years, and he is the first medical doctor to have ever served in this position. He similarly is very cognizant of the impacts of this crisis at the local level, having served under two governors as the health commissioner of West Virginia. Most recently, he served as the chief medical and health officer, interim chief science officer, and senior vice president at March of Dimes. Dr. Gupta. Good afternoon. Thank you, Bill, for that introduction. I also want to convey a thanks to Senator Manchin for his comments and hello to my good friends here uh, that you'll be joining with today on the panel as well. And hello to everyone participating today. This conversation comes at a very critical moment. As has been mentioned by Bill and Senator Manchin already, we've now passed the tragic milestone of over 106,000 deaths from overdose in a 12 month period. Now that equates to a life loss every five minutes around the clock. Most of these deaths, as has been mentioned, involve synthetic opioids like fentanyl and its analogs, and many involve stimulants like meth and cocaine. Now, let me be clear, this is not your parents' overdose epidemic. It is the, in fact, most dynamic drug environment that we have ever seen in this nation's history. Between 2015 and 2021, in just six years, we saw the overdose deaths double. And unless we take major steps, they'll double again, and probably sooner. Why? Because the drug supply is more lethal than ever before. With increase in use of synthetic su substances like fentanyl, Pandora's box has been opened. Now, new and deadly combinations can be created all the time and polysubstance use is becoming more and more common. And these substances really are entering communities that are often 
are not equipped with prevention, with harm reduction, with treatment, and recovery support services that they often need. So think about it. We have lethality, which is increasing in supply, and a response system that is not increasing at the same pace or even close to that. As a result, the overdose epidemic has been unraveling the very social fabric of our nation and destroying American lives and livelihoods. So how do we respond to these challenges? Well, in his State of the Union speech, President Biden announced his unity agenda for the nation. And top of that piece was beating the overdose epidemic. Just two weeks ago, the administration took a major step to deliver this goal by releasing President Biden's inaugural national drug control strategy. The strategy recognizes that this is not a red state issue or a blue state issue. This is America's issue. It focuses on two big drivers of the epidemic, untreated addiction and drug trafficking. Now, with the budget of over $40 billion, the president's strategy prioritizes aspects that we will help to make sure that we're addressing this crisis. Uh, it prioritizes four near-term actions that we must take to meet people where they are and reduce overdoses right this moment. First, the most important action that we can take to save lives right now is to have naloxone in the hands of everyone who needs it without fear or judgment. Especially today, when three out of four overdose deaths involve opioids. Now, harm reduction interventions like naloxone enable us to work with people who use drugs to build trust and engagement. I've seen harm reduction save lives in red states and blue. And as declared in a recent Congressional Commission report, it has bipartisan support. That's the reason I'm happy to be talking to you about this today. The President's strategy is the first such strategy in the history of this nation, in the history of this nation, to prioritize harm reduction. And so we're going to expand access to naloxone, a cost effective tool that has the most potential to save lives right now, right here. Second, the present strategy lays out actions to tackle a long-standing issue, which is that the majority of people with a substance use disorder are not getting the treatment that they need. Now we know that less than one out of 10 people, less than one out of 10 people who need the treatment are able to get it. And we know that treatment saves lives. Everyone who wants treatment should be able to get it. Through this present strategy, we will double treatment admissions for the populations most at risk for overdose death and ensure, ensure universal access to medication for opioid use disorder by 2025. Now, third, the strategy is unveiling a renewed focus on disrupting transnational criminal organizations and their illicit financial networks and supply chain. We've already brought the international community together recently to control fentanyl precursor chemicals. I spoke at the UN and we asked member nations to vote to control precursor chemicals for fentanyl and they did. And President Biden's budget proposals include substantial increased investments for border security and supply reduction. But we've got to do more. We must be innovative, and we have to hit the drug traffickers where it hurts them the most, their wallets. So, so through this strategy, we're going to work to more than triple the number of drug traffickers sanctioned and increase our border security. We're going to continue to work with other nations to make it more costly for drug trafficking organizations in every way possible. And we'll continue to work with our high intensity drug trafficking areas or called HIDAs to disrupt and dismantle domestic drug trafficking organizations and expand public health and public safety partnerships because it's gotta be done at the intersection of public health and public safety. You know, this work is critical 
And I say this because if it remains easier to get illicit drugs in America than it is to get treatment, we're never going to be able to bend the curve and overdose, and overdose deaths. Now, fourth, the strategy wraps up our work on data and research at a time when the federal government faces large gaps in data collection and analysis related to drug policy. For example, we know that one of the best predictors of a fatal overdose is a prior non-fatal overdose. Yet, we don't have consistent and timely measure of non-fatal overdoses across the United States. Never did. Been 20 plus years. Now, this limits our ability to identify emerging trends and act before it's too late. And I know this is an area that your report's very focused on. And I'm glad to see it there and glad to really see it make it in because without data, we're not going to be able to make progress. The sooner we can get this data, the sooner we can use it to drive good evidence based policy decisions. Now, in addition to these four areas, the presence strategy also directs federal agencies to take actions to prevent youth substance use, including through ONDCP's what we call the very successful drug-free communities grant program, which um, do a lot of work across the country. The strategy also supports people in recovery and workforce, and it's advancing racial equity in our drug policies related to both public health and public safety. The present strategy expands the scope of this work to address many factors that affect substance use disorder, including child poverty, employment, and economic opportunity. So people can reach their full potential. Now the actions I just laid out is exactly how the Biden-Harris administration will bend the curve on overdose deaths, and we must do that. This is a whole of government approach, and from President Biden on down, we are all committed to the mission. Now, ONDCP is leading this effort through federal government and coordinating with our state, local, tribal, and non-government organizational partners to make sure that we're all complementing each other's efforts. We're all going in the same direction. You all know that we're working at the intersection of public health and public safety, as I mentioned. That's the way I see it. What that really means is that we're in the business of saving lives and working together, we can save even more lives. As President Biden said in his remarks at the annual RX summit in Atlanta just a couple of weeks ago, he said, we're standing with you and we'll get you the support and resources you need to beat this. So I wanna really thank the Bipartisan Policy Center for hosting today's event. I think it's a really important one at a very critical time. And thank you to everyone who's participating and watching for all of what you are doing to help us beat this overdose epidemic. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Manchin and Dr. Gupta for your remarks and for your leadership on this important issue. I'm Michelle Gilbert, a senior policy analyst for BBC's health team. And I've had the pleasure of working on this report with our outstanding partners. Thank you once again to the Foundation for Opioid Response Efforts, the task force, countless experts, and the BPC team. The bold nature of ONDCP's 2022 National Drug Control Strategy reminds us that, although it's been nearly five years since the opioid crisis was declared a public health emergency, there is still much to do. With overdose deaths at an all-time high, and billions of federal dollars spent every year, policymakers remain unsure about whether recent investments in opioid-related programs are having the intended impact. BPC's new report, Combating the Opioid Crisis, Smarter Spending to Enhance the Federal Response, highlights recommendations for optimizing federal funding. You can access this report at bipartisanpolicy.org. It strives to use a whole-of-government approach, the way we are doing for the COVID-19 pandemic with opportunities to strengthen partnerships across the government and with states to enhance data sharing, guide decision-making, and incorporate effective interventions. Both the opioid crisis and the COVID-19 pandemic are designated as public health emergencies, yet the level of urgency between the two differs. Our recommendations fall in four policy areas. First, mandatory spending, which notes the ways in which Medicare and Medicaid funding 
could be leveraged for better coverage, higher reimbursements, and expanded provider capacity. Second, discretionary spending, which includes strategies for using grant funding for the evidence-based programs that work, bringing funding together from similar grant programs across the entire federal government, and using federal funding to fill federal grant funding to fill holes in Medicaid coverage at the state level. Third, data reporting and metrics, which mimic the close to real-time data that we have that have been so critical during the COVID-19 pandemic in showing the scope of the problem at the population level, with more frequent and actionable metrics for policymakers and for the general public. And finally, governments. Governance which focuses on strategies to enhance coordination and leadership around the federal response to the opioid crisis. This report offers mechanisms to support and finance interventions, which aim to expand access to evidence-based prevention, harm reduction, treatment, and recovery services in an equitable manner, while also working to reduce the supply of harmful drugs in our communities. We hope that it offers a path forward that it helps make the best possible use of our federal dollars in the interest of patients and that future lives lost are prevented. At this time, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Karen Scott, president of the Foundation for Opioid Response Efforts and our three panelists, Dr. Adams, Dr. Harris and Secretary Shalala for a robust discussion on the state of the opioid crisis and where we go from here. Thank you. Michelle, thank you so much. And thank you to Bill, the entire team at the Bipartisan Policy Center, Senator Manchin and Dr. Gupta. It is a pleasure to be here with you today. And um, it's been a pleasure for to have the Foundation for Opioid Response Efforts, a partner and a sponsor of this work at this critical, critical time. Um, without further ado, I'd, I'd like to formally welcome our panelists, all members of the BPC Task Force on Combating the Opioid Crisis, Dr. Jerome Adams, Dr. Patrice Harris, and former HHS Secretary and Congresswoman Donna Shalala. Donna, uh, for, for those of you who, um, who don't know, which is probably few, um, Dr. Adams is a Presidential Fellow and Executive Director at Purdue University's Equity um, Initiatives and Distinguished Professor of Practice he, of course, was the 20th Surgeon General under President Trump, a former state health commissioner for the state of Indiana, and is a practicing anesthesiologist. Dr. Harris is CEO of eMed, a company whose mission is to democratize healthcare through technology. Dr. Harris is a former president of the American Medical Association and has over 25 years of private practice experience in adult child, adolescent, and forensic psychiatry. And Secretary Shalala most recently served, represented Florida's 27th Congressional District from 2019 to 2021. Previously, she served as Secretary of Health and Human Services under President Clinton and as, and as former president of the University of Miami. Again, thank you so much to um, the three of you being with us today, and thank you to all of the task force members for the work over the past 12 months. There is of course a lot in this report and I'd like to get started by asking each of you to share with us um, what your original goals are, what you hoped um, we would accomplish with this through this project um, and what a couple of the priority takeaways and, and key points that you would like to impart uh, to the audience um, today. And I will start um, with Dr. Harris, where I will ask each of you um, for your thoughts on, on uh, getting us started with this question. Dr. Harris. Well, thank you. And let me say it was certainly a pleasure and an honor to participate on this task force and certainly an honor to be here today. So for me, it was, uh, very important that we build upon the prior work. I think Dr. Gupta mentioned the evolving nature of this pandemic. It's not a static pandemic, and so our solutions cannot be static. We have to have real-time evaluation of what's working and what's not working with a specific focus on the funding and looking at data, particularly disaggregated data. You know, so often we treat 
or respond to the mean. And we talked about in this report how important data was and how important it is to disaggregate. So uh, my goal uh, for participation was to, again, build upon the prior work, knowing that uh, we needed uh, new, new thoughts. Um, it's always good to uh, take data and go from the new data with new interventions with a focus on, on data. Thank you. Secretary Shalala? You're on, uh, Secretary, you're on mute. Um, thank you very much. It was uh, really a pleasure. I learned a lot as, as part of this uh, process from my colleagues and from the excellent staff. For me, it was how we leverage the big money, which is in Medicaid and Medicare, and how we make the experience for the patient seamless. I've always believed that um, to do good public policy, you have to understand people's lives. And it can't be um, uh, one uh, approach for everyone, but it has to be holistic. And, and it has to be sensitive about ethnicity, about uh, about income, um, uh, about age, um, as we uh, design these programs. So it's leveraging the big public programs, Medicare and Medicaid, and using some of these smaller grant programs in an integrated way. And that's a big challenge. Someone that's run HHS, I know exactly what kind of challenge it is. But government needs to be nimbler. And, uh, and HHS has the 1115 waivers which it can use to help shape um, some of the nimbleness that the uh, programs uh, require. So uh, we have a major recommendations on the mandatory programs, but the metrics, making sure those mandatory uh, programs um, are, uh, are focused on evidence-based is extremely important. Thank you. Uh, we're going to come back to, um, to delve more into um, some of the issues you just raised. Uh, Dr. Adams? Well, thank you so much for having me today. And I've got to tell you how exciting it was to work with the task force members because we had people who've been in Congress. We had a former uh, American Medical Association president, a former secretary. We had uh, the head of the Brookings, Inst Brookings Institute. We wanted to make sure um, no stone was left unturned as we came up with recommendations to try to turn the tide on this unfortunate crisis that's going on right now. And so I want to frame this for you all at a high level uh, as a director of health equity at Purdue University. And for me, I got involved to highlight the fact that inequity is a key driver of overdose deaths and a health equity focus is key to turning the tide. When I say inequity, I mean uh, racial inequity, uh, I mean gender inequity, I mean geographic inequity and inequity to access to services. I wanna highlight really quickly the highest increases in mortality rates are now in minority populations. We talk about this in the report. Between 2019 and 2021, Black and Native American mortality rates increased by 81%. And mind you, the previous record was 2019, increased by 81%. Hispanic mortality rates increased by 65%. And that's compared to an already terrible 40% increase for whites. We also know that the highest regional mortality rate in 2020 in the Northeast is lower than the lowest regional mortality rate in the West a year later. So we're seeing great disparities based on where you live. And just one more example, the, the report highlights that places that had more access to Medicaid and had more generous services provided through Medicaid actually had much better outcomes and lower overdose rates. So this shift makes it imperative, as Dr. Harris um, mentioned earlier, to separate out key data by race ethnicity, geography, and other demographic variables if we want to ensure an equitable response. Dr. Adams, thank you. Um, all, all, uh, all critical points and ones we'll again delve into a little bit further. I will pause for a moment and just a note to the audience um, that if you have questions, we will turn to take a few questions from the audience later in the hour. You can submit those um, via the chat on YouTube or LinkedIn. Um, or on Twitter using our hashtag BPC Live. Thank you. And Dr. Adams, I'm gonna come back to you because we spent a lot of time in the task force meetings also talking about data and, um, and a lot of recommendations in the report um, center around the importance of data and metrics. 
So could you talk a little bit more with, with all of us about why it was so important for this to be a key area of work in the report and how can that help us? How can better data at this point in time help drive us to better solutions? Well, before I was the United States Surgeon General, I was the Indiana State Health Commissioner. And I saw how firsthand it was difficult to create policy if you were driving the car down the street blind. And in every sense, we were driving blind. Um, we were at night, driving down the street at night with no lights on, looking in the rearview mirror. And we saw this happen again with COVID. Fortunately, during the pandemic, we actually addressed that problem. Uh, and even though the opioid crisis and the COVID-19 pandemic have the federal, same federal designation, the opioid crisis isn't being handled like the same level of emergency. Uh, there's a serious lag in the data we get for the opioid response. The best metric we have for the opioid crisis is mortality. And that information comes six to 18 months after the fact. To, to frame it for you all, if the same had been true for the COVID-19 pandemic, we wouldn't have had any of the necessary information we needed about hospitalizations, positive tests, and so on. We would have waited for people to die before we reacted. And in many cases, that would have been too late. A data-driven response allows for the general public and policymakers to assess in real time the scope of the issue. And this report notes four key surveillance metrics to understand population-wide prevalence and core health service delivery metrics to align effectiveness across states and healthcare settings. We feel these metrics will enable policymakers to better evaluate federal programs and assess the impact of federal funding. So, so to summarize, the data sets for opioid use disorder are decentralized. This limits informed decision making among policymakers, program managers, grantees, and even everyday Americans who want to know what's going on in my community. And for the data sets that actually are used, there are significant time lags. Uh, the data are housed in different systems that use uh, this, this, uh, different metrics. And improved data by race and ethnicity is going to be vital to identify those disparities in opioid use disorder mortality, prevalence, and care. Um, we need to update our federal grant systems because they are outdated. Uh, and to better establish surveillance and health service delivery metrics, the data collection instruments themselves have to be brought out of uh, Stone Age times. Uh, we need to update these systems, make them real time so that we can actually have better informed policy. Dr. Adams, thank you. Um, and Secretary Shalala, to turn back to some of the, uh, to much of the discussion around funding, and we'll come back to the mandatory funding piece in a moment, um, but certainly you um, also in your leadership roles oversaw many discretionary funding programs and, and much of the task force discussion uh, was around how to make those, those programs um, better. Can you, can you speak to us a, a bit more about that? How do you take discretionary funding programs and really make them as effective as they can be? Well, one of the things that you do um, is make the application process reasonably short so that community-based organizations who don't have sophisticated consultants helping them um, can apply for the money. And that money ought to leverage Medicaid money, for example, and it ought to be integrated uh, with Medicaid money. So uh, looking at the application process at the different dates for application so that um, uh, these relatively small programs, I mean, it's about $6 billion, can leverage um, $60 billion. I mean, whatever, $23 billion just in Medicaid alone, uh, but uh, making the whole application process simpler and more importantly, allowing that application process to be integrated in a way in which when you apply, you may be applying for two or three different uh, uh, discretionary uh, programs uh, as well. So I think it's, it's, it's simplifying the process and understanding um, who uh, your clients are for those uh, applications and making it um, being responsible in terms of making sure that you're getting the kinds of organizations uh, that you want to get. Um, uh, and that whole process needs to be uh, reviewed, simplified, and made more strategic. Uh, 
Thank you, Secretary Shalala. And Dr. Harris, I'll ask you maybe to come in next. And similarly, we certainly have heard a lot about states' um, uh, use of the state opioid response funds. Um, some states struggling at times to use it, and maybe to some of the points that Dr. Secretary Shalala just raised. Um, but wondered if you um, could could come in and, and add to that in terms of the uh, thoughts on how to strengthen those uh, the opioid response um, dollars and, and the effectiveness. Absolutely. So, you know, I, I hope that everyone uh, by now knows that we've had a woefully underfunded and under-resourced mental health behavioral health uh, system for decades. But that means, and, and we certainly need additional funding, uh, but that also means that the funding that is currently appropriated and allocated uh, needs to be maximized and leveraged in the best way possible as uh, Secretary Shalaya has said. So for those who don't know the state, opioid response dollars goes to make sure that um, there are um, uh, adequate access uh, to medications for opioid use disorder and evidence-based treatment, by the way. And uh, Dr. Gupta said one in 10, uh, when you look across this country, has access to this evidence-based treatment. So we have to make sure uh, that we are using this money uh, wisely. And so um, we want to make sure that we are using this money to reduce op overdose deaths. Uh, we want to make sure we are using this money across the continuum from prevention to recovery services. But uh, we had a GAO report that says some states are not spending this money. Uh, and so we, we wanted to, uh, to provide recommendations uh, from the task force report to make sure we are spending the money. Uh, but, but clearly sometimes the rules and the regulations and operating in silos makes spending the money difficult. So we recommended several things. One is, and, and Secretary alluded to this, closer and stronger partnerships between the federal government and the states, uh, easier, simpler applications, stronger coordination at the state level so that um, perhaps there's one funding stream uh, that could fill the gaps uh, you know, for uh, another funding stream. If one area of funding has spent all their money, but there are unspent funds on the other side, uh, states can coordinate closely together. State agencies can coordinate to make sure that they are spending the money in ways that fill those unmet needs. And certainly when we talk about um, authorization, um, two years authorization is certainly uh, where we are right now and that's okay but we need to start thinking longer term um you know it takes a program some time to get going and then you want to make sure you give it a fair opportunity to succeed or not to succeed sometimes we have to stop doing what's not working and so we we look towards an eye to multi-year authorizations and appropriations uh to allow that and to make sure we are spending uh, those dollars more effectively uh we know that uh, there's a reauthorization bill uh that was introduced in the fall and uh there are several areas of alignment in that bill uh, with our recommendations from this report thank you so much dr harris um and I will make another reminder to the audience. Um, again, you can submit questions um, either through the chat on YouTube or LinkedIn um, or on Twitter using the hashtag DPC Live. Um, Secretary Shalala, I'm going to come back to you. Uh, in addition to the discretionary funding programs, such as um, uh, Dr. Harris just described, the state opioid response dollars, the task force made a very deliberate decision to also include a focus on recommendations around mandatory spending. And you, you touched on this in your earlier comments, but can you say a little bit more for the audience about why it was so important to make sure we included the mandatory spending as well as the discretionary? Well, uh, that's where the big bucks are. And um, it, we need to expand coverage for opiate use uh, disorder treatment uh, we need to enforce parity. We need to expand the use of uh, Section 1115 waivers, especially for non-medical recovery services and coverage um, also for incarcerated uh, individuals uh, was a recommendation uh, that we um, uh, strongly uh, uh, endorsed. We also need to increase reimbursements for addiction services, um, uh, which are notoriously low and um, exploring alternative uh, uh, payment models that are patient-centered and holistic uh, 
uh, addiction um, uh, treatment can be very socially complex and clinically um, straightforward through the use of medications for opiate uh, use disorder or medication uh, assisted treatment. So the current fee for service payment structure doesn't pro prioritize the social side. Um, and we need to, um, of course, adopt new billing codes uh, for addiction services. As some of these have been introduced over the past few years, but that higher reimbursement will be critical um, uh, to make uh, these programs, uh, our, our strategy very effective. And of course, uh, we have to make it easier for providers, and I'm sure my colleague can talk about uh, uh, medical providers to deliver services, particularly those uh, that are administered through telehealth. Um, and, uh, and we need to probably eliminate uh, uh, some of the waivers uh, or make them uh, permanent um, uh, in this area. And we need to explore opportunities to expand the, the pool of, of eligible providers. We simply don't have enough providers who are well-trained and uh, we need to take um, a lot of existing people that would like to be providers in this area and make sure they have the training that's necessary. Can, can I add something really quick? Because Please, I, just wanna, I, I just wanna foot stomp something that the secretary um, talked about and that's the need to address the social determinants of health. We looked at Medicaid programs across the country and the ones that are having the best success are the ones that address transportation, that address housing, that address job training. But as the secretary said, unfortunately, traditional Medicaid doesn't reimburse for those types of services when they're provided. So um, many states have applied for waivers. As, as the secretary said, we need to make those waivers easier to obtain and then we need to make it permanent so that we can actually, people don't have to keep um, applying and reapplying and, and begging for the opportunity to address the actual issues that will help people out. We also saw that there was much more, there's not enough treatment, but much more money is spent on treatment than in recovery. And in recovery is where those social determinants of health really matter. And so imperative that we understand all the barriers that exist for someone who actually wants to get help to be able to get help and recover. And those barriers exist in the community. And unfortunately, our funding streams, our mandatory funding streams in particular right now, don't adequately reimburse providers and community groups for addressing those, those social determinants. That's particularly true of Medicaid. In Medicare, Medicare Advantage has extra money to provide some of these, uh, some of these uh, uh, socially determinant uh, uh, services. And uh, I think our emphasis on wraparound services, on, on long-term involvement uh, with, uh, uh, with our patients um, is very important. This is not something where you go in and you have a medical solution and you get in and out. Uh, that's what my colleagues in the medical field have taught me. Thank you. And Dr. Harris, I wonder if you wanted to, to add anything to, this, to these points. <laughs> Absolutely. And I don't think we can say this, uh, this enough. Addiction is a chronic disease and we need to think of it in the same way as we think about diabetes and, and hypertension. Uh, and so it is not an in and out, uh, one size fits all, a one time solution as the secretary just mentioned. And just like everything else from diabetes to hypertension, they all have biopsychosocial aspects, right? Because, and I'll just say uh, hypertension, certainly you need to take your medications, uh, but you also need to eat healthily. And we need to, and either Royal We, Society, uh, federal spending program, state, spending programs need to make the right thing to do, the easy thing to do, and increase access to all of these. And so uh, certainly it is about transportation. Can you get to services? And by the way, just as an aside, with telehealth, and we, we've seen this during the pandemic, uh, there have been lots of opportunities to increase access through telehealth. And so we will have to do a review um, and to see what worked and what helped and continue those services beyond this pandemic to increase access. Thank you. I'm going to get, in a, a, get to a couple other recommendations and before we turn to the audience questions. Um, Dr. Adams, as with any crisis, the leadership is crucial. 
Um, we were very fortunate to hear from the leadership of, of ONDCP a few minutes ago um, and see the White House strategy come out uh, a couple of weeks ago. Um, but we, the report includes several recommendations um, in relation to overall governance, um, to the role of ONDCP. And I wondered if you could um, comment on those and speak a little bit more to your thoughts on governance. But well, well, glad to, to comment on this because one of the things that we've heard from policymakers, from folks all over the country, is that ONDCP's role needs to be reoriented to focus more on policy leadership and federal coordination. That's why ONDCP was originally started in their original charge, but they have been de-emphasized in multiple administrations, not given appropriate funding, and their charge has drifted. And that's really caused a, a, a disharmony in, in the coordination of federal services. People don't know where to go to. Um, a lot of those services are at HHS, but even at HHS, is it CDC that you're talking to, or is it NIH, or is it, um, or, or is it, or is it um, uh, SAMHSA? Um, Department of Justice, you've got services over there. There's no one coordinating all of these issues. And so our recommendations really center around elevating ONDCP to be a center of excellence. We want them to triage new and emerging research so that evidence-based interventions can be included in the national drug control, control strategy every year. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we think ONDCP should guide the implementation of two sets of core metrics. And we lay those metrics out in the report. I won't go over them now, but they are metrics that people around the country feel would help them understand better um, what's going on at the moment. Just one of those recommendations is, is uh, ER admissions, emergency department admissions for drug overdose. That's a much better and real-time metric than waiting for someone to die and then waiting 18 months for that reporting to come in. We want ONDCP to improve interdepartmental collaboration across all of government, not just within one agency. Oh, and this one is key. Uh, the ONDCP director needs to be restored to cabinet level rank. We simply cannot uh, treat this with the, with the urgency that it deserves if the ONDCP director doesn't have a cabinet level rank and isn't able to be in the meetings and able to, to actually work alongside the same level as the other cabinet members from other agencies who have a, who have a dog in this fight. Uh, finally, uh, we suggest that uh, Congress consider the appropriate placement of the HIDA and the DFC programs because ONDCP has really gotten into the weeds in managing these programs. And that's not a terrible thing, but uh, it's taken them away from policymaking and put them more into the day-to-day -day work that we feel could be done better uh, with assistance from other agencies or perhaps even at other agencies. So ultimately, we want to lift ONDCP back up to be exactly what the name implies, the Office of National Drug Control Policy. Terrific. Thank you, Dr. Adams. And we certainly heard from Senator Manchin as well as Dr. Gupta of the, on the, the importance of a whole-of-government approach and the importance of having every every agency, every component um, of government brought to bear, bear um, and that leadership is a, is a critical piece of making that happen. Um, I, Dr. Harris, I'll turn back to you. And we had mentioned earlier uh, in the discussion about the, the evolving nature of the crisis with respect to demographics. Um, and uh, I wondered if, uh, if you could talk a little bit more about that from your perspective as well. Um, and what that means in terms of how we need to approach and address the, this next phase of the opioid crisis in terms of um, demographics related to racial and ethnic minorities, but also with respect to how much attention is uh, we're placing right now on the overall emotional and uh, mental health of um, our adolescents. Certainly welcome news to me as a child and adolescent psychiatrist that um, we are elevating our discussions around mental health and substance use uh, disorder. And we have in this report elevated uh, the changing nature as several of us have mentioned several times during today and it's it's fentanyl now, right? And it's, it's polysubstance overdoses. And Dr. Adams noted at the very beginning uh, the mortality rate now in communities of color. 
And he also noted how the regional differences have changed uh, and, and North, the Northeast is particularly hard hit. Senator Manchin uh, mentioned data from West Virginia. I am a native West Virginian. And so all of these data uh, points will, will change again as the epidemic um, evolves. And so we have to be nimble enough, uh, Secretary, as Shalala mentioned, the fact that we have to be nimble. And so we have to respond uh, to these new data points where we are now able, and hopefully will continue to be better able to get actionable real-time data. How will we change the formula? And so one of our recommendations in the report Court, uh, was that we recalibrate uh, the opioid state opioid response formula to take into account the changing nature of the demographics. And it, it brings to mind, I'm a former public health official as well as, as Jerome, and we want to think about prevention. We don't want to wait until the deaths are high and say your deaths have to be high uh, before you can get uh, funding, right? We want to have a, a preventive aspect and have the data. And if we see in a particular region, in a particular community, that the mortality rates, the overdose rates are increasing, we need to be able to address those. So we really need to look at a recalibration of the formula. Right, really helpful. And Dr. Harris, I'll stay with you because I think we have a question from the audience that I think follows nicely from, um, from your comments. Um, and the question asks, how do we make the, our processes more sensitive to those of lower socioeconomic status? Um, and as we're saying, inequity is, is a key aspect of the overdoses um, with mortality increasing by 80% in minorities in the past year. Um, so thoughts around uh, uh, the accessibility, um, particularly for, for those with fewer resources, um, how do we bring things together with more of attention to addressing that? Well, I first think we need to be intentional about the data and make sure that we are, are talking about uh, disaggregated data. So often, and I'm sure I've been given guilty of this as well, we will spout a statistic. And really that statistic is an overall statistic, right? It's not a statistic for a particular zip code or particular community. And so if we have that data, uh, we can talk uh, more, uh, we can talk uh, with increased accuracy uh, about particular communities. And then we can go to those communities and ask them what they need, because how we address this problem in West Virginia might be different than how this uh, problem is addressed in Vermont. Uh, so as we move forward and have the data, we then need to take the data to the communities, work with community-based organizations, with trusted partners in the communities, uh, so that they are aware, first of all, of the issue and listen listen to communities as to how we can best help them. And, and just to, to help people understand well, how this report addresses that, that's why we broke down mandatory versus discretionary funding. Mandatory funding is Medicare, Medicaid. Uh, those two programs alone pay for the majority, the majority of substance use disorder treatment. And a significant proportion of that is Medicaid, which serves underrepresented and disadvantaged communities. So if we can optimize mandatory spending we are going to, by definition, help send more funding to communities who are at risk, the communities that are served by Medicaid. That's number one. Number two, a lot of the issues that we talked about, those social determinants, are paid for through discretionary funding, through grants to different organizations. And Secretary Shalala said this earlier, we make it too damn hard for people out there who actually are working in these communities to be able to access funding. There are over 70 70 completely different funding streams uh, in the discretionary spending category. And these groups don't have time to chase after all these different funding streams. And we need to coordinate them to make it easier to get the resources to the people who need them the most. Thank you, Dr. Adams. Um, and uh, on that note, to Secretary Shalala, I will turn back to you. And it, uh, some of the discretionary recommendations also focused around this idea of braiding funds together. So to, uh, to the, the points made around everything in a silo and having to do multiple grant applications and piece things together. But can you, for the audience, um, just give us a little bit more of a background on how to think about that? How does, how does that work to braid funds together? Well, first of all, um, it's hard to do because each 
grant program has its own political constituency, its own sponsor in Congress. So, uh, so trying to glue them together in a way that's easy for the recipient, for the recipient organizations to apply for those grant programs. You can do it through the grant application process. There are a number of things that you can do. Um, and, and the states in particular could make it much easier um, for organizations to, um, uh, to apply for uh, uh, grant programs. Um, but uh, the difficulty is the, the politics around each of the grant programs, but thinking through what they do, who they're supposed to impact, and finding ways to make it easier uh, for the application process, but also making it, uh, making it possible to have a greater impact. Thank you. It takes us back to some of the measurement um, components of this as well, but really helpful, uh, uh, helpful uh, comments. We do have one more question from the audience. Um, how can we help communities acquire community-based technology to not only track overdoses, but coordinate getting people into treatment and supporting them in long-term recovery? So I think very much along the lines of, some, of what we were just saying. Um, other thoughts, and you start again with, with Dr. Harris, who we'll, we'll round out with this question. Um, other thoughts about how, how we really uh, connect with frontline communities, frontline providers to get the resources where they're most needed. Well, I would say here's where there might be an opportunity for grants for technology, but not just for one agency or one CBO, but maybe the state. Uh, could uh, develop a grant application where there's a shared technology for data sharing and, and some of the reporting. Because uh, we talked a lot uh, at this uh, task force about accountability. We haven't talked about that today, but the data helps us with accountability and evidence-based uh, treatment is a part of that too. So, so I think we should just be mindful of creating um, opportunities for technology where there's shared technology. And again, making the right thing to do, the easy thing to do, making reporting and tracking the easy thing to do if there's a shared, uh, shared technology infrastructure. Thank you. Bye. And I'll jump in really quick on that. Um, I just wanna, again, I want people to understand why we keep coming back to data. Um, in the beginning of the pandemic, I couldn't tell the president of the United States how many COVID cases we had, how many ventilators we had. Now, any person across the country can go to their State Department of Health website and find out how many COVID cases were in their community yesterday, how many beds they have or ventilators they have right now. We need that same level of data transparency for the opioid epidemic. We need an HHS protect like data sharing um, a situation for the opioid epidemic. And that will help local communities because then they'll be able to see their data and respond to their data specifically. And then we need to continue to leverage telehealth. Uh, we, we're paying for 10,000 telehealth visits per week pre-pandemic, a million at the peak of the pandemic, a lot of them for mental health services. We need to figure out how we leverage telehealth to get more resources at the community level so that people don't have to drive hours upon hours to get treatment. They can get it in their community. Thank you so much. Secretary Shalala? No, I, I'll yield to my two colleagues. I think they hit the mark. Great, thank you. Um, well, I want to thank all, um, all three of you, um, Donna, Jerome, Patrice. This was a terrific discussion. And again, thank you so much for your dedication, commitment, and time to addressing the overdose and opioid crisis in the United States. And I will turn it back to Bill for final words. Yep. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Scott, uh, uh, Karen, for leading this uh, very insightful discussion. I, I learned a lot from their input, uh, and thank you for, for support. Uh, thank you, Dr. Adams, Dr. Harris, Secretary Shalala, and BPC staff, Anand, uh, Michelle, and Michael. Uh, you know, Dr. Gupta said earlier in this program that this is not a blue state or a red state issue. This is an American issue, regardless of one's political affiliation. Let us hope we can move forward following on some of these recommendations and, this, and the excellent discussion today uh, and to eliminate this chronic disease as Dr. Harris has described it in this epidemic in the near future. Thank you again for joining us. 
and have a good day. Thank you.